Welcome to Everyday Motherhood, the podcast that inspires you to pause, connect, and play more every single day. The podcast that's focused on you, the mom, to help you fill up your cup and rediscover the joy and love in your everyday life. We can't parent alone, and parenting is too serious to be serious all the time. Thanks for being here. My name is Christy Thomas. I am the founder and developer of PlayForLifeMoms.com. Let's jump in. So I am so excited today to welcome Melissa Wiley. Melissa is an author of over 20 children's books. That number blows my mind, Melissa. (laughs) (laughs) And she's married to an amazing guy named Scott, who's a comic book writer and... Um, has five amazing kids. So welcome, Melissa. Six. Six kids. Did I get it wrong? Six kids. Even better. Don't want to forget anybody. (laughs) Well, thank you, Christy. I'm so happy to be chatting with you today. Well, I have followed you for a long time. I don't think you realize that I found you a long time ago because you and Elizabeth Foss and a whole bunch of other people early in my homeschool dreaming days when I had just a tiny infant were all really active bloggers. (laughs) (laughs) That's really fun. I like to, I, it blows my mind sometimes to realize I've been blogging, blogging long enough that people like had babies Mm -hmm. and decided to homeschool and are deep into homeschooling. (laughs) Yeah. It's been that long. Uh, but I, I started blogging in 2005. Yeah, so. and my baby, my oldest was born in 2006. So oh, I'm one go. of those people. Yeah, <laughs> where I read you while I was holding my baby and, you know, filling up time because we moved cross country when I was 30 weeks, 36 weeks pregnant. So, oh my goodness. So mm-hmm. here I am, like, you know, scouring the internet. The internet's still new and novel, <laughs> right? And there's no one around me besides my baby and my husband. So the internet helped a lot. (laughs) And you were one of those (laughs) blogs. I had the same experience, but it was in 1995 with the AOL like baby boards, which led me to the education boards, which led me to the homeschooling boards, which is how I wound up homeschooling. I was going to say, did you like homeschooling? You started way back. Yes, because my oldest, you know, is 25 years old now. She was born in 1995. I was the first person that I knew who had AOL at home. Um, (laughs) And I was the only person that I knew who was interested in homeschooling, (laughs) Um, which I which I hadn't known much about before I had the baby. But then like the second you have a baby, um, At least at that time in New York, where we were living, people were like, where are you going to send her to school? And I was like, I'm learning how to change a diaper. (laughs) Can you give me a minute? Um, But I started reading. I was like, oh, no, I guess I have to decide this now. So I started reading about options and suddenly we're homeschoolers. That's pretty much we gave I gave birth to this baby in California and people told me they'd already signed up for preschool (laughs) before I even moved there for kids that were just being born. And I'm like, wait a second. Huh? I was that thinking, was it exactly. And we're military. I don't even know how long we're going to live in this town. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it seemed amazing to try and make that decision for like my three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old when I had a, you know, three-week-old that I was still getting a handle on like burping. And <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. It's so fun to figure out how people ended up on the paths they end up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love origin stories. <laughs> you have wrote 20, over 20 books and your newest one that comes out this August, where in this podcast comes out right before your book, is the nerviest girl in the world, which is about a girl named Pearl who lives outside of San Diego, kind of, right? The city is just a little bit outside of San Diego. Yes, it's a fictional town called Lemon Springs based after the real town of La Mesa, um, which when it, uh, there was a point when La Mesa was called La Mesa Springs and there's a neighboring town called um, 
Lemon Springs. So how anyway, fun. that's how I got the name. <laughs> but I lived in La Mesa for 11 years before I moved to Portland three years ago. I love that you based this book on history that actually kind of happened in that town. Like one of my favorite things about moving so often is figuring out the story of that city. Yes, I love that too. And I love moving for that reason. I like having new places to explore. Um, I had lived in Mesa for just a couple of years when I heard that there used to be a a movie studio there. Back in the very, very early days of motion pictures, it was a silent film um, studio that made lots and lots of movies in the La Mesa area before things, before anything was being made in Hollywood. That's so Um, cool. So it sort of blew my mind, this idea that before Hollywood, La Mesa was the center (laughs) of movie making activity. It's so novel when you find something that's like, wait a second, about your town. (laughs) Like when I moved here, there is a stump downtown that's about George Washington, that they planted this tree when George Washington's body came by after he died because I live in this sleepy coastal Georgia town so there's this George Washington tree and then it fell (laughs) and they donated it to Ironsides in Boston like the whole yeah novelty of it right like wait a second that's really cool there are neat (laughs) little things in every single town that I've lived in if you just take the time to find them as I was reading your book and I got to the very end and I read your notes about what inspired you I was like this is so cool because any mom could figure out their town's history. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you, one of my favorite things to do is to go into the um, old newspaper archives wherever wherever I live. Some of them are on microfilm. Um, some of them, like for nervous girl research, uh-huh. I had to go to the archives at um, San Diego State University. So cool. But you can read. So I was able to read all of the newspapers from 1911. And they are just crackling with stories. You just fall over stories left and right <laughs> uh, in those pages. And one of the things that, that, like, when I started, when I got interested in the movie studio and started digging about it a little bit, there was this article from the La Mesa newspaper in 1911. And it was, it, it was basically like a letter to the editor by this irate person in town because this crew of actors had come to town and um, there were a lot of cowboys Uh because they were making westerns and you could not this is what the person said you could not let your daughters walk the streets of the town because these actor fellows would say things like shucks right out in public oh my gosh (laughs) like shucks and darn (laughs) oh my gosh so amazing (laughs) Um, so I loved that and then I started reading more and more and more and just got really interested in the whole story there's one of the phrases that Pearl says in the book she says duck soup (laughs) where does that come from that was a a common idiom of the day which again I I stumbled across um, (laughs) during my research I have just a notebook where I keep hold of any little tidbit like that anything of interest that that catches my ear or my eye (laughs) that is so fun do you often get inspired for your books just from living because you're busy I mean you have a whole family (laughs) and six kids and lots of other things on your plate advocacy like lots of things um yeah I always have a notebook with me always always and I'm, you know, like a magpie. Um, Anything sparkly that catches my attention goes in my notebook. So sometimes I can just sit down and leaf through and be like, oh, right. I thought that was interesting once upon a time. And um, it starts ideas percolating. Um, I I love to like in a coffee shop, if I hear a piece of like a a snatch of other people's conversation, I'll write that down. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have different notebooks for different things? Oh, I have an insane number of notebooks okay. <laughs> that serve different purposes. I have, yeah, I have like one that's basically a, a bullet journal, um, and I have my poetry notebook that I use every morning, and um, yeah, and then my big messy notebook, and I have my morning pages notebook, and um, and my notebook that is in my backpack, which of course has now been sitting in my backpack for. <laughs> four months not getting used at all I should reread it there's probably good stuff in there (laughs) from the before time did you were you like heavily inspired by uh uh 
Oh my gosh, what's the book name? The Spy Book. Harriet the Spy as a kid? Oh, I read Harriet the Spy like every year religiously, probably from the time I was eight or nine years old. <laughs> Um, I was so impressed with Harriet. I would never have had the guts oh, to she's sneak so into somebody's gutsy. house. <laughs> she's so gutsy. And I was always so mortified when her friends found her uh -huh. notebook and read all of her secret notes. Uh, that would, like, I have a notebook that I write in with the messiest possible pen so that nobody can read it. I love that. I love that you do that. <laughs> that like, that's your, your spell on it. Yes. <laughs> so that the kids on the playground won't be able to read what I've said. <laughs> yeah. No, because as you share your notebook collection, I automatically go to Harriet the Spy in my head. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Melissa would be an interesting person to sit in a coffee shop with. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, I think I, she, was, she was part of my education as a writer because she, she just observed the people around her and found them fascinating. And that made me notice what the people around me were doing and saying. And, you know, I thought her descriptions were so um, detailed and, and mm -hmm. vivid. And so that made me think about, ooh, like, how would I describe? I, I play a game, like, in an airport or at Starbucks. If I'm sitting and I hear people talking, I try and imagine what they look like. And I'll write out the little description before I turn around and see if I'm right. <laughs> That's a really fun game. <laughs> yeah, it's very entertaining. Were there other books in your childhood that like helped you stumble into becoming a full-time author? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, probably. Um, Anne of Green Gables that, and all of Ellen Montgomery's yeah. books um, were a huge, huge influence on me. Um, especially the Emily Aunt of New Moon books okay. by the same author, um, because Emily was a writer. She was a poet, and her writing was very important to her. She took it really seriously. And then um, Little Women, and even more so Little Men. Yes. So Jo being a writer, she was the one I really identified with, and I, I liked the idea that she was writing stories mm -hmm. all of the time. Um, but then Little Men... When she's grown up and she yep. has basically her own little school. Yeah, she does. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that that's probably like 95% of the reason I wound up homeschooling <laughs> six children. <laughs> <laughs> Was I wanted my own plum field. I used to, in high school, I went through a whole phase of writing. We would call it fan fiction now. I would write these stories where like there was time travel and I accidentally wound up back in time and had to go to school at Plumfield and I was so happy because it seemed like it's so much better place to go to school than my school. <laughs> that is fantastic and you're right like the word fan fiction didn't exist then but it totally yeah. was right like yeah that's exactly what it was <laughs> yeah it's like Mary Sue fan when it wasn't even Mary Sue because I wasn't it wasn't a character representing me it was just me yeah <laughs> No, yeah, like I remember vividly writing spinoffs of the Babysitter Club books that oh, like yeah. included me, like I was suddenly. <laughs> That's right, and now like now, now Netflix, you ask, yeah. <laughs> now you have the name of. One I know of them, right? it's so crazy, <laughs> and we're watching it on Netflix, and my kids keep saying like, "Okay, Christy Thomas, you're very bossy." I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, okay, I wasn't Christy Thomas then." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> As you're writing books and you're writing all these books and taking notes as you go, you're also living a very creative life. Like that's just kind of the heartbeat of who you are, isn't it? Yes, I think <laughs> I think creative practice is super important to me and I just don't feel right if my day does not include some form of creative activity. So early in motherhood, were you creative then too? Um, yes, I didn't really identify it as like, I'm going to seek out a creative activity mm -hmm. at that time. Nowadays, I think about it a lot. I think about how to make creative practice a practice um, that happens with regularity. But in those days, um, when... This is so, like, now I crack up thinking how, how ambitious I was that I thought I could pull this off. When my baby was born and I was in this little apartment in Queens, um, I got interested in weaving and I bought a secondhand table loom. Oh, my gosh. And just decided to learn how to weave. And I, I, you know, I, like, there was the internet, but there wasn't a lot of internet activity. It took me a while to find where the weavers were on the internet. Um, in the mid 90s. Yeah. But 
I um, had a book and I just learned from the book and I made, you know, a few sets of dish towels and some scarves. Um, and then we moved. And, and I remember like, it, like, I remember the baby on the on the floor under the loom because it, it had a stand. Uh-huh. And you have to warp your loom and it's a big process. And I, I would put her on the floor and she would just like, she loved to lie on the ground and look up at, you know, <laughs> things moving above. <laughs> um, and my husband was learning to play guitar that year. So I just have really fond memories of that whole, like he would be playing and I'd be singing and I'd be weaving. And, um, How and we were like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's so fun. So you did weaving. What other things have you tried and then like put away? Because I'm sure you've tried lots of things in the last oh, 25 sure. years. I sometimes say that, I, I sometimes say that my, um, my garage is like an archaeological dig <laughs> of, <laughs> of the creative activities I have tried out. And what's nice now about having all these older kids is that anybody who's interested in something, there's probably a box in the garage. (laughs) Um, Some things I have cycled through and I'll do it for a while and then come back to it another time. And some things I've tried, you know, sort of once and just like beading. I tried at a certain point. Um, Crocheting. I learned how to crochet when I was a little girl. And so I've done that on and off um, Uh throughout my life. Um, I love to embroider. That's really my big ongoing mm-hmm. pursuit. I um, also, my whole life, I wanted to learn how to draw. I took this, I took a costume design class in college, and we spent like three whole weeks working out of Betty Edwards' book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Oh, yeah, that's an amazing book. It is, and I loved it. I had never really been able to draw, and now suddenly I was drawing things that looked like real things. Like, I drew a shoe that looked like a real shoe. Yeah, I know. (laughs) That book is really amazing. If you haven't seen it, like, go write a sticky note right now. Pause the podcast, (laughs) then go put it on hold or find it used somewhere. It's really worth getting. Wonderful book, and it makes the argument that everybody can learn to draw. I was really persuaded by the part where she talks about, like, if... If you can write your name, you can make all of the, you have the hand control. Yeah, we don't give try. ourselves credit for that, right, how complicated right. writing is. Right. So it's really about learning how to see. And so I took that class and I loved it. And I don't know why I didn't take any more art classes after that. Um, I... I didn't do any more drawing really until, again, when I had a new baby, well, a toddler, right? And... <laughs> be sitting at the table with crayons and I started trying to draw things like out of the books that we were reading Ah. and I got to where I could draw really well quickly like a cartoon giraffe and a cartoon alligator that was it (laughs) and then my daughter when she was almost two she got sick and we spent a long time in the hospital and at one point it was so funny to me (laughs) um they were repainting the playroom and they wanted to do a mural wall and you know we basically lived at the hospital for nine months so they came and said would you like to paint stuff on the mural wall we know you're an artist and I said what are you talking about no and they said no you draw all the time they had seen like the nurses had seen me draw my giraffe and my crocodile (laughs) you're two (laughs) things you got good at (laughs) really it that's all I can draw (laughs) But a few years ago, I decided again, okay, I'm really going to do it. And I started learning how to draw um, from classes online at Creative Bug yeah. and Sketchbook School. And um, and now I, I, like, I've, I can kind of draw now. So it happened. That's so cool. <laughs> Not as I would like, but um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. To you, be able when to you were learning to draw, process. was that like a daily commitment you did? Is that what I've heard before from you? Like it was a daily process, right? Yes. Yeah, so I just made sure I always had a sketchbook beside me and, um, things that I enjoy drawing with. So I love Prismacolor colored pencils and that's like the official, uh, colored pencil of the American homeschoolers. <laughs> <So>. Absolutely <laughs> it is. <laughs> Of course, I, we had a big set of those, so I, I would keep those handy, and I found some pens that I liked to work with, and um, I did. I practiced every day for a really long, I mean, I, I guess, I'm trying to think, that sort of coincided with when my daughter went to college, because I remember sitting in the parking lot outside um, the hotel in her college <laughs> town, uh, doing my first ever, like, 
drawing out in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that would have been around 2013, okay. 14, somewhere around that. So six years, I guess I've been practicing it. That's so cool. Um, and I still draw every day. I'm glad that you dappled in drawing again, like that you didn't say it was I'm too old or there's not enough time or all the things that we yeah. think in our head that will like instantly limit us from trying something right. new. Well, and when I thought about like how much I wish I had stuck with it when I took that class in college, how much better I would be now if I had had, you know, 30 years of daily practice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I realized, well, you know, whatever I was then uh, in my early 40s when I decided to start trying again uh -huh. um I thought well if I like I bet 10 years from now I'll wish I had started 10 years ago so I decided to just dive in fantastic <laughs> I love that and because of you and your brave writer keynote in 2016 my family has tried out the is it creative bug is that the classes you like creative bug. yeah we are hooked on the creative bug and there are really great 31 day drawing challenges on that website yeah. that we've all yeah. sat down and done at different times. And they're so simple. I, I love those. I've done a lot of those different challenges. Um, I think I took Lisa Congdon's basic line drawing class at Creative Bug. That was my first drawing class that I took when I started um, learning again, you know, as an adult. Um, and what's funny is then I moved to Portland and I met Lisa and we're friends now. That's so cool. So <laughs> She's a lovely, lovely person. Her um, stuff is so inspiring, her artwork. Yeah. I, um, I often think of her, there's this poem that I love and um, it, the, the last lines of it, it has to do with um, a woman like eating the last honey cake that her mother made. Um, and it's a year after her mother's death. So she's been saving it this uh -huh. whole time and now she's eating it. And she's having this sort of moment of feeling like her mother is speaking to her. And the last lines of the poem are, leave something of sweetness and substance in the mouth of the world. Oh, wow. Is, uh, when I read that poem, I thought, oh, that's my, my whole... <laughs> That's my entire reason I make things is the hope of leaving something yeah. of sweetness and substance in the world. And um, whenever I read that poem, I think, oh, Lisa should totally do one of her beautiful art prints with that quote. She should. <laughs> Have you sent it to her? Have you told her? Otherwise, I'm going to send this podcast to her. Be like, Lisa, you know what? <laughs> Melissa's <laughs> raving about you. <laughs> I have been meaning to send it to her. Um, I had it. We, we were going to have lunch yeah. in March and Pandemic. I was going to give it to her in March. And now, so it's been sitting on my desk this whole time. I just need to put it in the mail because she's just right down the road. <laughs> but what a good line. When you're doing these creative pursuits as you're raising kids all around you and writing books, are they doing them with you? How are you managing all of this? Yes, yeah, sometimes. So I will say that there was a big chunk of time where my creative activity was more about starting things that I was interested in trying and then helping my kids do them because because it's like if you build it, they will come. Absolutely. If you start doing it, they will come and they will want to do it. So I didn't finish any or many sewing projects mm -hmm. when they were little. Um, I If I pulled out the paint, they would want to come paint. I mean, Absolutely. that's Absolutely. That's how it goes, right? Yeah, that if I get out paint, I know that I better also get paint more paintbrushes than I think out. And so I've always made sure they had easy access to stuff. In our old kitchen, uh, since the, the dinner table was in the kitchen, there was a whole kitchen drawer that was nothing but like kids paint sets and placemats. And like I wanted them from the age of three to be able to go to a drawer and get anything they needed to paint. Yeah. All by themselves. Um, other things like I, I realized that I had stopped um, stitching, embroidering yeah. um, for a long time because it wasn't super compatible with babies. Yes. Like, oh. yes. <laughs> um, like have a, a handsy little baby in your lap. You're not really able to do embroidery as easily. Well, that's why I stopped um, knitting because my toddler <laughs> would wander off right. and uh, pull so the knitting I, off the needles and I'm so frustrated for a bit. 
<laughs> but a couple of years ago, I got back into embroidery, and I hadn't been like super skilled before. But now that nobody's grabbing the needle out of my hands, um, I I stitch constantly. Um, that's a good way for me to listen to podcasts and audiobooks is by stitching. Um, it's also part of my writing practice, which I know sounds funny, but how is embroidery that? is a hugely important part of what helps me keep focused while writing. And I only discovered I discovered this while writing Nervous Girl. Okay. So here I am trying to write Nervous Girl. Um, and struggling, yeah. <laughs> struggling, struggling, because the world is very distracting. And so every time I would like get stuck in writing and you have that moment of where you need to stop and think for a mm-hmm. second and the temptation to open a tab to Twitter or Facebook or to check Instagram or just to see what's happening or to go to Amazon, you know, like all those temptations, Etsy. There are so many ways. <laughs> and it's death to flow. If you're in a flow state with writing and then you click over to your Twitter tab, boom, it's done. You're out of flow. And it takes about 25 minutes to get back mm-hmm. into a flow state with writing. So... What I realized was that if I kept an embroidery hoop nearby and and specific types of projects, like one where I knew what I was going to do yeah. in it. So yeah. not cross stitch where you have to count and pay attention. Right. Something with um, back stitches or something simple. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like a cozy blue mm-hmm. sampler or a drop cloth sampler. Um, something where basically decisions had already been made for me. Yep. Um, and I, I would, so I have a little, I'm going to pull it down because I know you can see me yeah. even though we're on a podcast. I have a, like a Trader Joe candle yeah. tin, it's metal, and I put magnets on it. That's fantastic. And I thread a bunch of needles and stick them so they're right here in arm's reach and by my writing chair. So when I get stuck while I'm writing, instead of clicking over to a tab, I pick up my sampler that is right next to me at all times. Aww. And... I have my needles threaded and I can stitch and then I'm thinking because busy hands are activity, busy hand, like an activity that keeps your hands busy or taking a walk, taking a shower, doing the dishes. That's part of writing. A lot of writing happens away from the keyboard. That's really important to hear as a mom as I <laughs> like ask my kids the right things and to know that right. this is coming from an author that's saying this. So what let me I- say it again, say it all again for me so I can really <laughs> appreciate because I have a kid that's super busy and I'm always like, huh? Okay. <laughs> Staring into space yeah. is part of the writing process. Pulling weeds in the garden is part of writing. My husband's walk home from the subway when we lived in New York, that was when he got his best writing done. Um, in the shower, like whenever he's stuck in a scene in a comic Uh script, he's writing, he will take a shower, um, washing the dishes works. One of my favorite stories from uh, about another comic book Uh writer, a friend of ours named Chuck Dixon, who, um, wrote Batman for years and years and years. Um, Chuck, you know, worked from home writing comics. Uh, one day his... (laughs) His wife was home and she walked in and he's lying on the couch with his eyes closed. And she said, oh, I thought you were working today. And he said, I am. Because he was lying there thinking out the next scene. And then when he had it, he got up to write it down. (laughs) So that kind of um, busy hands activity for me, it's got to be busy hands. For Chuck, it was enough to just be in a, like, it looked like he was doing nothing. Right. I often, I, like, if you catch me a big chunk of my writing time, I'm probably just staring blankly into space. That you know? is so like, good to hear. <laughs> daydreaming is important. Downtime is important. Letting kids have time where they look like they're doing nothing at all is really important. And I, I do know that, like, it's a struggle. Like, lots of moms see a kid appearing to do nothing and think, oh, I should, especially I think homeschooling uh-huh. moms are prone to it. We're so used to, like, making the most of all of our moments well, and time. <laughs> and I think that, as I remember, like, my classroom teaching days, because I taught third grade, and, like, what I see at home, it's so easy to forget what other kids your age look like when they're doing work. 
Right. That's true. Like the That's age true. normative, like, oh, most seven year olds <laughs> do do that when they're working. But I don't know that because I only have one seven year old next to me. So I think yes, that's a big exactly. challenge of homeschooling sometimes is forgetting what the age looks like. Yes, yes. I taught, um, when we lived in San Diego, I taught a small group writing seminar to one of my kids and several um, friends. Yeah. So eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, I had this group that I taught every week. And there was a funny moment where um, the girls all came in and they were supposed to turn in an essay that day. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of sheepish looks around the table. Like um, I was up so late trying to finish. And we had this talk about the writing process. And I said, like, do you guys have time carved out in your day where you can go and write every day? And they <laughs> and they all were like, well, um, <laughs> basically their moms were putting them to work right. on other things because they didn't look busy with because they were doing the thinking parts of writing that makes sense and so I've had to, I had to write a note to all the moms and be like hey I'm teaching I'm teaching your girls that writing involves thinking stuff out so let them like look like they're loafing because they're working in their heads <laughs> yeah it's so easy to want to make sure your kids are busy I think Julie right. Bogart said, or some J Dottie said it, her friend, like, homeschool moms are oh. never happy, right? Like, we want them outside when it, they're <laughs> inside, or we want them inside reading when they're outside. We're never going to be happy. It's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> you have this wild, crazy, creative life. So you've done drawing, you've done weaving, you've done stitching and sewing, you've tried mm -hmm. beading. What thing would you never want to try again? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so at one point I decided I was going to become a quilter. <laughs> um, and by the way, like, I think in every one of my third trimesters, I suddenly had a burning need to learn some new artistic skill. <laughs> so uh, that's a lot of third trimesters yeah, that I had. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so with quilting, I actually started a whole, like, quilt along with this group of women from the our blogging community yeah. and we would all make each other quilt squares and we did it from January to August and I made you know so each month it was one person's turn and you all made a quilt square to send to that person did it I did it for everybody and then the turn of mine came up and I completely I just stopped. Like I didn't do, I haven't, I haven't done it. Like that's probably all in my garage <laughs> in one of the layers of the dig. <laughs> but all those other people went on to finish their quilts. Um, so that's amazing. I did recognize that sometimes I, because I like to try new things, yeah. I love to try new things. Not everything is going to take. Um, quilting didn't take because I, I don't like the cutting and measuring. I don't like that part at all. <laughs> um, every time I've tried to sew something like a, a, a set of curtains, I, I go crazy because the cutting and measuring, mm -hmm. I just, it's too precise. I hate cooking. I don't like to cook, although I do love to bake bread. Um, but that's the only, and so that's one of my cyclical yeah. pursuits is baking bread. I used to do sourdough. I had a whole bread blog back in the day. <laughs> and then I didn't bake for probably 10 years. Um, and now I bake again um, every week. That's fantastic. That's so fun. It's so fun that you've lived long enough where we can see that even if you've <laughs> gone through different creative cycles, right? Like if you're stuck in that phase, because I know there are varied ages of moms that listen, like moms with three-year-olds and four-year-olds and then moms with older kids, um, that like there's this hope that you go back and forth and back and forth if you want to. Like you don't have to feel like when you have this toddler that like you're never going to get to try that thing again. Right, right. Things have seasons. I think it fits into my whole, the way I think of things in terms of um, high tide and low tide, which is that tidal homeschooling mm -hmm. concept that sort of um, describes how homeschooling has worked for us. Um, things the tide ebbs and flows for my interest in certain activities or for my ability, you know, for the practical side of it to work out. Um, I noticed I rearranged things here in my studio a while ago and I haven't, or I stopped painting. I used to do a lot of painting, um, just like messing yeah. around with paint, not really, not really like 
good painting, but fun yeah. painting. And um, now that I, I like set up this whole poetry and stitching corner yeah. for myself, I realized, oh, I'm not sitting over there where the paints are. <laughs> that you're not, <laughs> or if I yeah. things up, if I put paints away, I will not paint. I have to leave everything out, almost like I just left it, so that I can sit down at any moment and paint. That's so good to hear. Uh-huh. That's how I have to leave it too. Like if I clean it up, <laughs> that project's forgotten for an unknown amount of time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So because of you this year, I've done more cozy blue stitch kits. Like I totally <laughs> found cozy blue stitch kits through you. And then that new novel 80s, 70s flashback, right? Bar- Bargello? Is that how you say it? Barge- yes, Bargello. Yeah, Bargello is so fun. And my kids, like my 11-year-old, and, or she's 12, 12 and 13-year-old, like it's super easy for them. I haven't tried it with my 7-year-old, but I'm sure he could do it. Like it's not complicated. Yeah, it's. I like it, especially on the plastic canvas for yeah. little kids because you can cut like a bookmark or a coaster size yeah. piece of that plastic canvas and the holes are pretty big, the needle's blunt. You know, it's, it, I think it's a great craft for, for little kids. Yeah. I think that if um, a mom is looking for something, that that would be something really easy because it's wool and it's plastic needles and. Yeah. I love it. I, um, I, I couldn't resist trying it when I was seeing it on Instagram yeah. all the time. <laughs> and it's, it's really, I don't enjoy cross stitch all that much. I love embroidery. Yeah. Um, with a you know a variety of different yeah. stitches, but counted cross stitch is a little bit too. Is it too um, precise, less, like less, your math and scissors and cutting? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it requires a degree of of paying attention that I'm not very good at. Yes, <laughs> yes, I can um, totally. And when I want to pick up a project, I want it to zone out with versus like have to think about. Right, right. So Bargello for me is like the satisfaction of following a chart to make a design, Mm -hmm. but without, uh, you do have to pay attention to it, but I don't know, something about it seems less fussy to me. So it just really works for me. And I love wool. I love holding wool. Um, And I like the geometric patterns. That's always fun too, just to be able to play. So yeah, I have made a, a like my house is like (laughs) bit by bit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> being taken over by Bargello projects. That's so fun. We made the Valentines and passed them out and mailed them to people. And those are so cute. They were so much fun. Like we could just sit and listen to an audiobook and we could all work on a project. And yeah, our hands were busy. So I, I love yeah. that. Like I love just being able to listen to a book and not feel bad that I'm listening to a book because I'm making something for someone like, I would have to do something during this yes. time. <laughs> too. I can't just sit and listen. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I probably ha- am a little ADD um, <laughs> because just sitting and listening it takes a tremendous amount of focus. Mm-hmm. I can't do it. I have to doodle or something. I have to have my hands yep. doing something or I, I really can't hear you. <laughs> oh, yeah, completely. Like I go to lectures or go to talks and my notes are filled with like washi tape strips and multicolored markers. And my husband yep. sitting there next to me, it can be like a formal Navy presentation, like for a pre-deployment meeting evening. And then I've got like <laughs> little cartoon submarines. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I can't listen without <laughs> looking like I'm a elementary school teacher. Like I look like I'm <laughs> an art teacher wherever I go, even though. That was never what I thought. (laughs) (laughs) I can so relate. So, yeah. So every, is there anything else you want to give as a gift to a mom who wants to live a creative life? Like if you were to give one piece of must, like what do you wish you would have heard when you had littles around you about giving yourself space for this? That's a good question. Okay. Um, I have three thoughts that come to mind. One has to do with encouraging creativity in the household, just uh, period. Because that's a big question that moms often ask me is like, how can I get kids to be more creative? And one of the first things I ask back (laughs) is, do they have a place where they can leave a project in progress out? Because as you and I were just saying, like if we clean up our project and put it away, we probably won't come back to it. 
um, I'm sure that a lot of what's in my garage unfinished is because the baby was born and I packed it up to get it out of the way. Yep. Um, or the movers and, came for me, like the Navy's like, time yeah, to go. Yeah. So let's pack it yeah. up. <laughs> Projects do need breathing time. They need space where you can leave the mess out and you have to allow that for yourself as well. So it was really important to me to carve out just some little bit of space. Now in San Diego, um, I didn't have, like, I have a room here. It's a small bedroom that I use as my studio. Um, and I deliberately called it a studio instead of an office. Um, I love that. So that Word I remember choice. that when I walk into this room, I'm here to, like, this is where I can write and, and make art. Um, and it, consequently, it's, like, my kid's favorite room in the house, too. <laughs> of course, right? Like, you have uh, a studio. So, yeah. But... Before the studio, I worked on my bed. I wrote like five books sitting on my bed um, because for 11 years, I did not have any space in the house besides our bedroom. I had a tiny little Ikea nightstand that I used as like where my stuff lived. Uh And it was still set up so that it was in easy reach. Sketchbook and colored pencils were right there on my nightstand. Um, so access is, is super important. The other thing that sprang to mind was my friend um, Edith Hope Fine, who is a wonderful children's author. Um, her son works crazy, crazy hours, and Edith knows that I have a lot on my plate. I you know, wear a lot of different hats, so I work a lot. And she said, um, I'm going to give you the same advice I gave to my son. It's called 24-7. Okay. Seven days a week take 24 minutes to do something for yourself that's just fun. That's huge. So, isn't that big? Yeah. I love that. 24-7. <laughs> so I, I really took that to heart. And when I, even if I'm on deadline, even if I'm super stressed about work, I will think, okay, I'm going to take my 24 minutes. <laughs> and is there like your flower walks that you take or tree walks? Are those part of your 24 minutes? No, those started just as part of um, when I was recovering from breast cancer yeah. treatment. My, my doctor said, I would like to see you getting 30 minutes of active exercise a day. That is one of the best things that you can do to prevent recurrence. Um, and so I started taking walks and I was really, I mean, at first I was so tired. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could go for like five minutes and I built up to 30 as I was, you know, recovering from radiation. And the more I, but it was my first spring in Portland yeah. after living magical, in Southern California. Yeah. yeah, and it was Portland has an incredible spring. It just starts rolling out in February with you know the first wave of bloom, mm-hmm. and it it just really doesn't stop. So I started taking pictures. Oh, the other thing was that I during radiation when I was like really too tired to do anything. I mean, like. I was like a phone with 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 no charge right. left. Yeah, right? radiation's just hard. But it was in my body. My brain was still all revved up. And that was really hard, I found, like lying there feeling completely unable to do anything, but pinball happening inside my head. And I took this course um, in iPhone photography just as something that I could do, like I could manage to lie on my side and hold my phone in my hand and watch these videos. <laughs> so when I started taking those, those walks, yeah. which was the first time that I ever like walked by myself. I mean, I still, you know, I walk with yeah. my kids, I walk with my husband, but alone and not multitasking, not listening to a book or something yeah. to maximize that <laughs> time. Like just, being alone with my head, it was a new experience. <laughs> and so I started taking pictures and then photography became a keen interest, um, just documenting the waves of bloom. That's amazing. Uh, now, I know I said I had three yeah. things and I'm, now I've <laughs> I know I sidetracked you. Yeah. It, it might come back to me 24 um, 7 and easy access. Let's see if it comes back to me. Um. (laughs) Yeah, there's so much here, though. Like, I am just, it's so fun to watch you be an adult. (laughs) Well, that's really sweet. That's so nice. It's because I'm still half kid. Um, Like, the things that I like doing are all the same things my kids like doing. Um, 
I know, but because game. of you, I play, um, like, oh, what's that farming game on Nintendo? Ah, uh, Star- um, Harvest, Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon, or- yeah. And we've played My- so much Animal Crossing in this pandemic. <laughs> Right? Like, <laughs> you got my kids onto Harvest Moon when we were moving. Like, we talked about something over Instagram one time. So I went out and bought it. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is fun. Like, I need that break too to right. have time. I- that 24 7 is such a big idea. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, I love it. It's just an easy hook to wrap your, your head around. Yeah. Um, there's also a podcast by Michael Nobbs, N-O-B-B-S. Okay. Um, Michael has um, M-E. It's, uh, w- that's the name of the syndrome, like chronic fatigue okay. syndrome. Um, and um, he was a graphic designer. And then he developed this this illness that just, it, it's like he's on radiation, like on and off yeah. all the time, yeah. right? Something like, so hard. The way I yeah. felt then. Um, And so he had to really dial back his level of activity. And he, at a certain point, he started just one thing a day, um, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And he would set a timer. His podcast, um, which is called One Thing, some one more thing, just one thing. Um, Anyway, he that so he started doing a podcast about. Here's (laughs) he would he would say. Here's what I'm going to do today. He would set a timer for 15 minutes and then come back and tell you how it it went. That's really awesome. And you could you could set your timer and like pause yeah. him and do your 15 minutes of whatever creative thing you were going to do. And whether that meant crocheting a few rows of a granny square yeah. or drawing something. Like he would draw on sticky notes. Like I'll just draw yeah. one picture on sticky notes and after a while he had a whole wall full of sticky notes yeah of drawing um i was very inspired by that i discovered michael actually right before my breast cancer diagnosis and so the timing for me to be listening to his really wise Uh advice (laughs) um for it doesn't have to be a big like i think of writing like yeah i need a big block of time to get into that flow state Mm -hmm. right but it doesn't have to be like that um you can be creative in 15 minutes. That's really important to hear. <laughs> and 15 minutes a day is probably how much time I spent practicing drawing for, you know, these past few years. And in 15 minutes a day, I have made progress. That's fantastic. Um, well, how else, besides all these creative pursuits, how else do you take care of yourself, Lissa? Oh, what a good question. Um, okay, so... I have a rule for myself um, that I, I started doing two years ago, uh, probably about the time that I was beginning to feel really stressed over writing Nervious Girl, <laughs> and the deadline was in sight, and I had a long way to go. I made a rule that I call poetry before screen. Okay. And so when I wake up in the morning, I am not allowed to open my phone and check any kind of social media or email or anything until I have read some poems and done a little bit of writing. So I um, I like to do Julia Cameron's Morning Pages, mm-hmm. if you know that book, The Artist's Way. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I'll do Morning Pages, but there's also a poet named Holly Wren Spaulding okay. who uh, has wonderful poetry classes online. And um, she does this 21-day poetry challenge that I've taken several times and so with her, that was the only, like, I would, I would print out the email and leave it so that the next morning it would be waiting for me so that I would not be tempted to open my phone. That's huge. No, like pre-planning that. So I try to take a, like yeah. a digital free day and I have to always remember, like, do, am I going to need directions somewhere? Like, do I need to go to the MapQuest route again and print out? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good point. You can really sabotage your efforts to stay uh-huh, offline. Yeah. Um, yeah. by needing to get online uh-huh. yeah. yeah and I'll ha- I have a writing app um that I will let myself open yeah that is not you know writing mm-hmm. in my browser um yeah right that makes <laughs> um, it be it's so, not twitter it's not instagram or facebook yeah like. <laughs> yeah those tools are important so if I so I'll read a few poems and then usually using Holly's practice um 
And you just take an image from the poem or a word that jumps out at you. Maybe there was a, the word sometimes was in the poem. Uh-huh. So you just grab that word sometimes and you go to your own notebook and write sometimes. And just, you know, See. sometimes I'll set a timer and write for 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, other times I'll just let, you know, see what happens. But that's my rule, poetry before screens. And I'm a much happier person when I'm sticking to it. I, I love that simplicity of having just was, a rule. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's and I so it's my morning practice and I really cultivated it like a practice. I built a whole little like I wake up, I turn on the cocoa, uh, the water, the hot water kettle yeah. for my cocoa. I open the, the kitchen door and I like greet the morning yeah. <laughs> because the sun is coming up over the neighbor's roof and, um, and then I make my cocoa and then I read the poems and then I write for a little while. That and if I do that, and that can be 24 minutes, you know, I can get it right there. Oh, I um, believe it. Yeah. <laughs> like that, you can find space just there. Um, you can so start your day with it. Time. That's really cool. Um, so how are you playing and enjoying these kids that are in your house? <laughs> well, we are playing a lot of Animal Crossing. Uh-huh. Everyone um, is. It's <laughs> like the pandemic. Like if you haven't played Animal Crossing this pandemic, have you really lived in this pandemic? I don't that's know. That's right. <laughs> it's such a community experience. Uh-huh. And it's we, you know, that game was supposed to come out um, like a year ago right. and it was delayed and it was delayed because the company made a commitment to letting their staff have family lives. I love Instead that. I didn't know that that was the story. Like I knew it was delayed and I knew my twins were like instantly, <laughs> like they were counting down the days right, for this to happen. Right. It, it was, it's, it was about quality of life because so many tech companies just work their people to the ground and expect them to be like these young 20 yeah. somethings who can just, you know, work 12 hour days. So the game was delayed and they had no idea that this delayed launch date of March was going to coincide with everybody being home. Yeah. It was like the and best he, gift that it could have given them. And you know, another really sweet story about it is that, um, you know how when you catch a sea bass in the game, yeah, and then thing says, "No, wait a minute, make it a C plus." Right. They, the first version of that script that that one of the writers yeah. wrote said, um, "Or at least a C minus." <laughs> and somebody else on the team said, "You know what? People are going to see that over and over every time they catch this fish. It should be something positive." That's hilarious so they, because yeah, you catch a sea bass a lot. <laughs> yeah. So instead of always being like, uh, like it, it got downgraded, it got upgraded. It is in the so message. cool. That's really sweet. So my kids got me that game as um, kind of a Mother's Day uh-huh. anniversary present. Um, <laughs> it's so <laughs> fun. It's been it's such really a fun, fun game because not only has like it's just cute and you know. But like the Washington Post has written so many articles about it in the New York Times. Like it's been such a big learning experience because right. I've been oh, able to show my kids like, look, here's Nook is on on there now. And <laughs> right. here's this article about how people are selling celebrating Ramadan on Animal Crossing and That's just these awesome. novel things like the Washington Post, like every week for weeks <laughs> on end would have a new Animal Crossing story. Well, and it's a huge learning opportunity that just happens organically. Like my my eleven year old got so into we were trying to get a blue rose, which is oh, very yes. rare, and we were following the, these different hybridizing paths. <laughs> yep. um, and one one was kind of it was four steps, so it was easy steps, but it gives you a one in sixty four chance ah. of blue. And the other one was 10 complicated steps, but it gives you, you wind up with flowers that give you a one in four chance Ooh, of a blue yeah. hybrid. And so he got like, like he understands probabilities now. That's so cool. Uh, and Harvest Moon, I can say taught, like I remember um, being so amused when one of my daughters who at that age, eight, nine, 10, did not enjoy doing math. She put together a Harvest Moon notebook where she calculated the profit margins on all of the different crops that you could raise <laughs> based on like factoring in was it a one time crop or a repeat and how much did it cost, you know, initially and how much did it sell for? 
Um, <laughs> it's so I'm amazing like, the sneaky learning yeah. that can happen when you just like take a step back from like the shame of oh it's a video game if you get stuck in that pattern right and right. see oh no she did there. harvest moon math yeah for a full year that's so um, cool. And you know, there's a new Harvest Moon yes. dropping tomorrow. <laughs> you know, we're excited about that too. <laughs> we also have a family Minecraft realm. Oh, yes. Um, so that we can all play from different devices in the same world um, all, across different platforms too. And we started doing that when my oldest went away to college so that she could play with us. Um, and then we did let it lapse for a yeah. long time, but now we have it back. Um, during the pandemic, we started it again. It's really <laughs> neat. My kids have a realm and they play with kids from different states that we've moved from. So they have this realm of kids in Michigan and Washington State and Nebraska. Really it's cool. so interesting how technology can tie us together. It's been a really good time for that. Yeah, yeah. It's so nice to have those possibilities. Yeah, and I love seeing how my kids take a book that we've read and turn it into Minecraft. Have your kids done that? <laughs> yes, yes. And sometimes we've like built the pyramids yeah. because everybody was you know, somebody was on an Egypt kick. Or um, I don't know if you've done the Brave Writer Jot It Down. Yeah, project. The fairy tales. Did you? Did your kids build fairy tales in there? Yes, we did like Rapunzel's Tower and um, the Three Bears ha or, and the Three Pigs Houses. Um. <laughs> yeah, my kids made a whole like special world just for their fairy tale Jot It Down project. And they even made like CDs. So every character had its own song associated with it. Like they got really, it was really funny. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. No, they went, they went deep. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm sitting there nursing my youngest at the time, I was like, okay, like, sure, keep going. <laughs> my uh, daughter, who's, well, she's 14 now, but she was 13 at the time. She took an out school class um, that was Minecraft based, but it was a civics class. Oh, how it was interesting. The thing. So the teacher had built a town, but then there were like lots where they could build public buildings. Yeah. And they all got to also develop a store. And um, they were the city council and they had to vote on things like a budget, a town budget, and then decide to spend it on what? A fire department or a library. And they built all that. It was so That's cool. I wanted to take the class. <laughs> there are so many neat things. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Melissa, for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me, Christy. This was so much fun. If people want to find you online, they can find you at your blog, right? At Bonnie yeah. Glenn, here in the Bonnie Glenn. And then yes. in Instagram, you're just Melissa Wiley. Is that right? Or do you have a name, different name there? On Instagram, it's Melissa Wiley Books. Okay. Um, and on, but Twitter is Melissa Wiley. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. This was delightful.